Good morning. I guess there's no harm in starting a few seconds early, right? No. Okay. So just for, for some logistics, for everyone's awareness. So the... All right. No. It's no. on now. All right. All right. Can you hear me in the back? All right. I got the gentleman in the nice pink shirt nodding yes, so I think we're good. All right. <clears throat> so for logistics, for those of you who are, are accustomed to being here in this setting, the restroom arrangement is still the same. The nursery is still down the hallway. The only thing that I would add is that the nursery slash women's restroom is now available out this door and up the stairs. Okay. So good morning, everyone, and welcome to our worship service. Uh, it is always great to see you all here. We are encouraged by your presence. We hope that you find encouragement in our presence. I'll be reading to you to start this worship. Psalms 138. I will praise you with my whole heart. Before the gods, I will sing praises to you. I will worship toward your holy temple and praise your name for your love and kindness, your truth, for you have magnified your word above all your name. In the day when I cry out, you answered me and made me bold with strength in my soul. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your eternal spirit. Thank you that we're able to gather here freely and worship you and that we find strength and, and encouragement with each other and that we find uh, strength through your word. God, we thank you for your son and his sacrifice and we are able to have access to you even through our prayers. We ask that you would continue to dwell with us as we continue to worship you in spirit and truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Good morning. I want to welcome everyone this morning. <coughs> For you, those of you who are visitors, we don't typically meet in the lower level, but we are doing it uh, because we're doing a renovation upstairs. And I just wanted to give a real quick summary to uh, our members, and this might be helpful for people that are visitors too. If you are considering a large renovation in this environment, catch my arm, I've got a couple of comments. And if your renovation happens to include upholstering and rebuilding 650 linear feet of pews, we should schedule a long lunch to discuss it because it's a much more interesting project. <laughs> anyway, that kind of gives you a perspective on what's been going on. Let's begin this morning with number 248, Far and Near. Far and near the fields are teeming with the waves are ripe and gray. Far and near their gold is clean. Send 
high speed. Our second song will be 104, Ferris Lord Jesus. Ferris Lord Jesus, so much. We're so thankful to you for all of the many, many blessings that we have. We would pray at this time that you would help us to be mindful of our blessing. Sometimes it's very easy to be distracted by the, the trials, by the challenges of life, and just kind of overlook how blessed we really are. So we want to keep that before us. Father, we want to pray that you'll be with us in, in and through each of our challenges of life, each of our uh, struggles that we might go through. We want to pray especially for those of, of our number who are sick or hurting or going through treatment, being thankful for the recovery of those who are recovering. And Father, we thank you for this place to meet. We do pray that You'll be with the finalization and finalizing the reconstruction or the remodeling of, of the auditorium. And uh, we look forward to being up there in, in uh, safe pews and, and uh, the, we're very thankful for being able to, uh, to have this. Father, we thank you for all of this congregation. Thank you for your church everywhere. Thank you for the salvation that comes, that comes with it. We thank you for the love that is uh, shared amongst us all, that is exemplified by by you and your great love for us and Jesus' great love for us. We would pray, Father, that you'd also be merciful to us and forgive us when we come up short of your will. 
forgive us when our faith might falter just a little bit and make us stronger, Father. Increase our faith every day. Father, we thank you for our leaders that we have here, for our elders. We thank you for those who serve in special ways, our deacons, our ministers. And we thank you, Father, for all of the teachers, including all of those who work so hard in, in World Bible School. Pray that you'll be with them, be with their students. We pray now, Father, that you'll continue with us in this service as we render our praise to you, as we study from your word to the sermon later. We pray that we'll be able to glean things from it that will make us stronger and more like you and in, uh, in, in from what we learn. Now this, Father, we pray through Jesus Christ. Amen. Today's scripture will be from 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Verses 8 through 12. Let us stand while we're um, speaking the Lord's scriptures. For even if I made you sorry with my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, for I perceive that the same epistle made you sorry, though only for a while. Now rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. For observe this very thing, that you sorrowed in a godly manner, what diligence it produced in you, what clearing of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what vehement desire, what zeal, what vindication in all things you proved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Therefore, although I wrote to you, I did not do it for the sake of him who had done the wrong, nor for the sake of him who suffered wrong, but that our care for you in the sight of God might appear to you. Please be seated. We're going to start out this morning with two or three slides that we used last week. And that's because this is number two this morning in a series of four lessons that for lack of a better description, or maybe it's just kind of the simple way I think about things, I would describe as meat and potatoes preaching. We're not talking about some of the more profound, deep, puzzling truths found in God's Word. There are plenty of those to be sure. But instead, this is a series of lessons and we're thinking about the most basic building blocks, pillar principles, of our obedience to Jesus Christ. And so for these four Sundays in the month of July, Kevin preached the first Sunday back a couple of weeks ago, and here's the plan, or rather that we're going to try to follow. There's faith, repentance, confession, and baptism. And you'll notice that we're building upon each lesson as we go. And I think we pointed out last week that Jesus sometimes used this approach. In Mark chapter 4, he gave a parable and he talked about sowing seed. It falls into the ground and then it springs up. And when the plant comes up in the field, 
Well, there's the blade, and there's the head, and there's the ripened fruit on the head. And the Apostle Paul used this approach, but he reversed it, you'll remember, in Romans chapter 10. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, but how can they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how can they believe unless they hear? And how can they hear unless someone is sent to preach? And so there's the backward orders. There's the declaring of the word, the hearing of the word, the believing of the word, and then calling upon the name of the Lord. And so this morning, we're thinking about how that our faith, our trust, our belief, our understanding that I am a sinner in need of a Savior, and Jesus saves, that leads me to make changes in my life, to stop where I am, to turn around, to go the other way. And all of this is described by one familiar word to us, and that's the word repentance. And you know, when we talk about repenting, there are some Bible verses that we just might say are classic. Everyone's familiar with Luke 13. Jesus said, unless you repent, you'll perish couldn't be much plainer than that, could it? On the day of Pentecost, Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you. In Acts 3 and verse 19, Repent and be converted so that your sins may be blotted out. The Apostle Paul in Athens, there was a time that God overlooked or winked at he let go, let slide some matters, but now in this day and age, he has commanded all men everywhere to repent. Second Peter 3 and verse 9. God's not one way with his promises like so many. People make promises and don't keep them. God's not that way. But God is not slack concerning his promises, but is willing that all men come to repentance. Well, those are verses that you no doubt know, and many of you can probably rattle off from memory, and that's great. This morning we're looking at a different text. And the reason why I chose this text it's not the simplest, it's not the easiest, it's not maybe the clearest to develop, but it's a comprehensive text. It includes several things that we ought to look at. What is repentance? What are we talking about? And what causes it? Where does it come from? What moves it? And then how do you know you have it? when you had it? What do you do when you had it? And all of these are addressed somewhat here in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Now then, just a word of background, and this is not intended to be lengthy or exhaustive, but 2 Corinthians is kind of a tough letter to read. There's a lot that's going on and it may be helpful if you haven't read through this material in some little while, just to back up a step or two or three and then take a running start and to go into it. If you were to say what is the relationship between the Apostle Paul and the church in Corinth, well, one good way to answer that might simply to say, well, it's complicated. It's, it's, it's complicated. Yeah, I know it, and yeah, I can tell you, but it kind of takes a while to put the pieces of that puzzle together. Paul went to Corinth in Acts chapter 18, 
preach the gospel. People were obedient to the faith. And when Paul left, there was a church of God in Corinth. And that was the same story repeated all the way through the book of Acts. But after Paul left, something happened. Apparently there were teachers that came in. They may have been from Jerusalem. And they said, well, you know, Paul's a good fellow. And he means well, bless his heart. But. You know, he didn't put the proper emphasis on some matters. Circumcision, keeping the Sabbath day, the kosher diet, and some other things that God revealed to our fathers in the long ago, and these are universal things. Paul isn't giving enough attention to those things. And so these Judaizing teachers, and that seems to be the description that best fits, they came to Corinth hard on the heels of the Apostle Paul, and they made trouble in the church of God. And they turned many of the saints in Corinth against Paul. Read 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians and what they were saying about Paul. Well, when he's with you, he's not that impressive a fellow, but boy, when he's away, he can write the sternest, most brilliant, most eloquent letters, and that wasn't necessarily a good thing. There were some teachers that they favored, like Apollos and maybe some others, and they were artful, skillful, eloquent men. They said Paul kind of stumbles and mumbles his way through a lesson. I've heard better preachers by far. And then Paul really wasn't an apostle. He was kind of a Johnny come lately. And he wasn't one of the twelve, don't you know? And so again, There's friction between the church in Corinth and Paul after Paul left. So what did Paul do? Well, apparently he made another quick hurry-up visit to Corinth to see if he could straighten some things out. And you can read a hint of that in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and the few verses there that begins the chapter. And that visit didn't go well. Have you ever thought, well, now then I'll just straighten out this mess. I'll end this fuss. And you stepped in, and maybe you didn't make it worse, but you didn't make it any better. And that kind of says something about Paul and the Corinthians. It wasn't a good visit, and Paul left with hurt feelings. And so he sat down and he wrote a letter to the church at Corinth, and apparently it was a letter that didn't spare a single thing. It stripped the bark off the tree. Because when they rejected Paul and his authority, they were rejecting the will of God. It wasn't God's purpose that the Gentile world keep all the law of Moses No, Jesus is all we need, and we are justified apart from keeping that old covenant. And Paul wrote a letter that was just as plain as plain could be, and then he worried about it. He lost sleep over it. His language apparently was so blunt and plain He wondered if maybe did I do the right thing. There are several letters that Paul wrote to Corinth, and we don't have those. They've been lost to history. And we're thinking, well, surely those were not the inspired revelation like 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. Paul probably wrote a bunch of letters, and some of them we have there in our New Testament And some of that correspondence is lost to us. 
the church at Corinth wrote to Paul asking questions, and we don't have that letter anyhow, any either. So here's Paul, and he's somewhat stewing, concerned, sleepless, bothered, and then on his travels, Titus catches up with him. And Titus comes from Corinth, and he says, everything is better now. All still a little work to be done. Few fences to mend. But they received your letter, and they saw the people that were troubling them in a true light. And there's been a reconciliation between you, Paul, and your children in faith that live in Corinth, and everything is looking up again. Well, that's kind of the story of 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 8 through 10. You're not supposed to read this text on the screen. You know, I thought we were going to be upstairs this morning with those two big 85-inch monitors, and but we're not upstairs. We're back down here. You're not supposed to read everything here, but the reason why I put the whole text on one slide is kind of get to this. And I hope that maybe you can see that there are some words and they're in capital letters and they're green. Can you see that? And the word sorrow and sorrow. The verb form of it is found six times in these few verses. And the noun form of it is used two times in these few verses. Did you know that in 2 Corinthians, the 13 chapters, Paul uses the word sorry. You're sorry. I'm sorry. We're sorry. We're filled with sorrow. He uses that word 18 times. That's one reason why I see that 2 Corinthians is kind of a tough read. You know, we read Philippians, and it's rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. It's a smile on our face, and we're walking in the footsteps of Jesus. And everyone, except two women that need to be straightened out a little bit, they were fussing with one another, Everything else is upbeat and positive, and it's a good time and a good feeling. And then we read Paul's letter to the church at Corinth that we call 2 Corinthians, and on almost every page, there's hurt feelings, there's sorrow, there's regret. Besides the eight times that Paul uses the word sorrow or regret or sorry, he uses twice the word regret or remorse. And so this is the backdrop of Paul writing to the church at Corinth. There are hurt feelings all around, and Paul says, I'm sorry for that. I'm sorry I had to scold you. I'm sorry I had to fuss on you. And is there a parent or grandparent that doesn't sympathize with Paul? Sometimes you come home, you fathers, and you have to be fathers. Sometimes you mothers, you love that child, but yet that child needs to be told no. Sometimes, sit down, be quiet. There's a time out. And there's discipline that has to be administered. Paul says, I'm sorry that it came to that between you and me. And if it was just, well, I don't like Paul. I have other people I would rather listen to. Paul says that would be one thing, but when you're rejecting the apostolic authority of Christ, that's something else, and I had to say so, and I wish that I didn't, 
I wish that I didn't have to, but I did, and so there it is. And what I wrote made you sorry. Is there anybody in the room this morning that doesn't know what it's like to have hurt feelings? I mean, we share in that, don't we? We all know how that goes. There are some days, and maybe it's not any one thing in particular, but there's just kind of a blue. Sometimes it's an outright purple that comes over us, and things just aren't right. Sometimes there's a falling out between friends, between brethren, husband and wife, parent and child, neighbors, and it lingers, it bothers us. Well, here's the mood that we see in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. But you notice also, Paul uses a word twice, and in this one, capital letters, and I put in purple, he uses the word repentance. And as we go through the text, we can see at a glance that being sorry isn't enough. There's a sorrow of the world. There's hurt feelings. There's feeling bad. There's regret. There's remorse. There's the agony of, I wish I hadn't done that. I wish I hadn't done it that way. I wish I hadn't said that. There's the hurt and the remorse and the regret of that. But then Paul says there's something else and he uses the word repentance. The word regret, remorse. Well, in the original, that's the word. And it's the same word that describes Judas Iscariot. You'll remember he betrayed Jesus. And when he saw what he had done, he was filled with remorse. And he brought back those pieces of silver to the Sanhedrin council, to the Jewish high priest, and tried to give the money back, tried to undo it, but it was too late. And the depression so deep and steep that he went out and hung himself, well, that's the word that Paul is using here for regret. I'll not ask for a show of hands. But I suspect that if I did, and if I were to ask you, have you ever been involved in Have you ever been around a church fuss, a church split, a church coming apart at the seams. There is a hurt like no other hurt. So Paul is talking about him being estranged from his Corinthian brethren and the false teaching that drove a wedge between them and how that this was the worst possible thing in the whole wide world and now that it's in the rearview mirror, He's readdressing that and saying that it had to be done. It needed to be done. And there was sorrow. And there were enough people that were saying, I'm sorry, all the way around. There was regret plenty. But Paul says, now then here's what it did. Instead of just remorse and hurt feelings, it led to repentance, and that's the change of mind. That's the hurt feelings, but doing something about it. That's the hurt feelings, and it leads to something more productive than crying and sleepless nights and hand wringing and wishing over and over and over, I wish this had never happened. Here's the notion that I did wrong and I need now to do right. It's that change of mind that pricks and makes us say, 
Well, I've been doing this, but I'm not going to do that anymore. I've been living this way, but I'm not going to live that way anymore. I've been going in this direction, but I'm stopping, and I'm now going to go in another direction. The Corinthian church, they've been listening to those false teachers and their hybrid Jewish-Gentile theology and gospel. And now they're putting that off, and they're coming back to the true ground of their salvation, the gospel that Paul preached and others, Titus, and the other helpers that traveled with him. And here in 1 Corinthians, or rather 2 Corinthians chapter 7, I think by highlighting the words and using these two different colors, we can see the great distinction. There's feeling bad, and then there's true repentance. When you do something about it, when you stop, when you change, when you turn around, and when you go in a different direction. And you'll notice that Paul says that it's this godly sorrow that leads to repentance. There's a sorrow of the world, and that leads to death. Godly sorrow. And there's the true pricking of conscience and the true hurt feelings that motivate someone to say, I'm going to do better from now on. And so Paul, kind of after the fact, now that the smoke is clearing, the dust is settling down, however way you want to describe it, He's saying that we've been through a rough patch, but you know, looking back, well, it had to be done. We needed to go through it. And now let's get beyond it because we've reestablished our bond that is in Jesus Christ. And then notice also that Paul talks about the fruit or the aftermath of true repentance in Matthew chapter 3 John the Baptist looks up and there's the scribes and the Pharisees coming out from Jerusalem to hear him to see what all the commotion is about and John says oh you bunch of snakes who warned you to flee the wrath to come not very hospitable to his guest at all and then he says, let me tell you what you ought to do. You ought to repent, and you ought to bear fruits worthy of repentance. You know, when I change my mind about something, whatever it is, when I change my mind, there's only a couple of ways that you can know I changed my mind. Number one is I tell you, I've changed my mind. But the second way, you see my change of mind. You see my change of heart. And it's evidenced by my change of direction. And so repentance happens on the inside. The change of mind. And no one can see that. Not even an x-ray machine shows that up. But what we do that indicates whether our repentance is true and genuine or not. Paul says, I know that those of you in Corinth is more than just feeling sorry because it produced in you a diligence. I think some translations have an earnestness. You know, there are some things that, well, I'm wrong, and I need to do something about it. And I'm going to, I'm going to. But this word for diligence or earnestness, the indication is I'm going to do it right now. Not put it on. I need to get on it. I need to take care of this. And Paul says that's what you in Corinth has shown. That's what your repentance has done for you. 
It's not one of these days I'm going to make things right. It's a decision that is imminent and right now. And notice he says not only your diligence, but your clearing of yourselves. And that's in the original, the word apologia, apology. We talk about apologetics, a ready defense of the hope that is in us with meekness and fear. Well, in this context, what Paul is saying, you had this right now, I need to start doing right. And then your apology <laughs> or your defense or your clearing of yourselves. Well, you know, I acknowledge fully what I did. But Paul, we want you to know it was never a lack of love for you and appreciation for your sacrifice. We let it go too far. Yes, we let it get out of hand. But we never lost our respect for you even though we can see why you might would have thought so from the words that were directed against you. But a part of this reconciliation, the words that soothe over, and smooth over a separation. And that's what the Corinthians were doing now. Paul says your repentance came with indignation. Have you ever had a good talking to yourself? How in the world could I have done that? Why in the world did I say that? Or why didn't I speak up and say something? What's the matter with me? Well, I have those talks from time to time. I suspect you might too. And that's what the Corinthians were doing. Their repentance led them to look back on the decisions that they had made. And maybe on the margin of your Bible, if you're a gifted note taker or an artist, you might do a head slap gesture. That's what the Corinthians were doing. What were we thinking? How could we have so mistreated one of God's servants? And why in the world did us Gentiles even want to go and be restricted by that old covenant of Moses? Never given to us. It was a hardship even on those folks. Why in the world did we accept second class status in the kingdom of God. What were we thinking? Their repentance led them to the word fear or alarm. And the word in the original is the word phobia. You know, we've messed up. And in speaking against God's messenger, we were disputing the authority that God delegated to the apostles. Oh, we're on dangerous ground there. We need to take a quick step back, and maybe not just one step, but three or four or five in a hurry, because the direction we're going will result in the loss of our soul. We need to get back right. We need to get back right with God, and we need to get back right now. Their repentance led them to a vehement desire or zeal, and those words kind of go together. There's been a time or two, a thousand, that I've been forced to apologize, obligated to apologize. And with gritted teeth, I'm sorry. <laughs> like it hurt when the words were pulled out of me. Well, this is the opposite of that. They were falling all over themselves to take back their hurtful words, their hurtful deeds, and their wrong action. And it was with eagerness. It was with a sense of urgency. Now that we see what's right and what's wrong, and we've been in the wrong, there's the need to turn and to turn in a hurry. 
and to do it with zeal, to do it with concern, and to do it quickly. And then with what? Vindication. And different preachers, teachers, commentators, scholars, translators, they take this word and they explain it in different ways. And it's a word that's deep enough and broad enough maybe to give rise to several different notions, but the idea is, you know, sometimes when we go after the wrong person and then we realize that we went after the wrong person, our reaction is not only What's the matter with me? What was I thinking? But turning to that person and saying, What's the matter with you? And how come you didn't know any better? Why in the world did I listen to you? It would seem that these teachers that came to Corinth hard on the hills of Paul and drove a wedge in the fellowship of God, these Judaizing teachers, now that the majority of them see the light, not everyone did. And that's why Paul is going to write chapters 10 through 13 of the letter. But here in chapter 7, for those that are getting back and have truly repented, all is commending them and saluting them for their quickness, for their courage, and for their turning back to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so here Paul says, Now in all things you have shown yourself to be clear in this matter. I think the NIV says you have shown yourself to be innocent. You know, the word innocent, that concept, doesn't mean that we never did wrong. But it means that our wrong is behind us and we've been forgiven. This morning, those of us that have been washed in the blood of the Lamb, we stand before our God, not as sinners, but we are used to be sinners. And now we are innocent in the and that's what Paul is saying to the church at Corinth. Yeah, we had that disagreement. And you rejected the counsel of God. You went after a gospel that he would write to the Galatians. And Kevin is leading us in a study of Galatians in this class before our worship. And he says that there's not another gospel. And if you go after another gospel, you are to be accursed. That's what the Corinthians were in the process of doing. And now Paul says we're past that. And now, now, by your repentance, your true change of mind, turning around and doing differently, you're showing that you're clear in this matter. And once again, forgive and innocent in the sight of God. Oh, God's not willing that any of us should perish. But that matter of repentance often stands in the way. It's easy to say, I'm sorry. Well, easy enough. But to say, I have sinned. I've been wrong. And my life, I've been going in the wrong direction. I need to stop and turn and walk in the footsteps of Jesus. I need to repent. That's the charge that God gives us. That's the charge that God gives us all. Our belief in Jesus leads us to a change in life. And that's what the Bible calls repentance. This morning, if you're with us, and you're not a child of God, 
and there's a stopping dead in your tracks and a turning around and starting back another way. And belief in Jesus is the motivation for that. And it will lead you to confess his name and put him on in baptism. Well, that's what you need to do even this morning while we stand and as we sing together. I hear thy welcome voice and call me opportunity to take up the partake of the Lord's Supper as we do each week. Before we do that, we'll sing uh, the first two verses of 140, I hear the Savior say. of the Lord's Supper. If you'd raise your hand, some gentlemen are ready to bring you one of these so that, uh, that uh, you might partake. No one? Very good. Thank you. I try to make it a point to thank those men who conduct or oversee the Lord's Supper to thank them for the, the good words they have when they come forward. Sometimes we hear something quite original, a verse I hadn't thought of before in the context of the Lord's Supper, or, or they might bring to, to light something that I hadn't thought of with regard to the Lord's Supper. 
But oftentimes, too, we turn to those familiar verses in one of the Gospels or in uh, First and Second Corinthians and read those words. Uh, Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, first took the bread and then the fruit of the vine. And I'll read those verses in just a moment. What's vital with the Lord's Supper is that there's a certain sense of feeling that comes with it, if you will. Not an emotion, perhaps, a, a sense of what Jesus Christ did for us. And it's through these elements, which are the, the bread and the fruit of the vine, that we come in contact with Jesus, his body and his blood. Jesus might have established, say, a special prayer before the Lord's Supper, or not even had the Lord's Supper. In other words, on that night he was betrayed, he may have told the, the disciples, you know what, your worship services recite these few words, and that will be, in a sense, uh, sufficient for the purposes of, uh, of the Lord's Supper, or not even it would be called the Lord's Supper, it would be called rather instead a moment of reflection on Jesus Christ. But he gave us these two elements, this bread and this unleavened bread and this fruit of the vine, that we might come in contact through our smell and through our taste and, and even the feel of these elements, the body of Christ and also the blood of Christ. And Jesus said while they were eating, he took some bread and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to them and said, take it, take this, this is my body. And then when they had taken the cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. So with that in mind, would you all pray with me now? Father, we thank you for your son's sacrifice. We thank you for the body he shed for us, the, rather the body he sacrificed for us, Father. We thank you that we have these elements before us now, this bit of unleavened bread, this bit of fruit of the vine, that we might come in contact with the body and the blood of Jesus, at least symbolically, Father, that we might remember, Father, what he did for us, and we may carry this not only through this moment, but carry this memory, these thoughts, through this coming week. Father, we thank you again for your Son, Jesus Christ, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Pray with me, please, for the fruit of the vine. And Father, we thank you for this fruit of the vine, this bit of grape juice, which represents the blood that your son shed for us. Father, why did he do it? How could he do it? Because he did it because of the love he had for us as he hung on the cross in, in indescribable pain, Father, and his blood ran down his body. Lord, we thank you for that blood, which now redeems us in your sight. May we, Father, try to live a life of repentance and, uh, and, and works and, and faith that reflects this great sacrifice. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. of the hymn we just sang, I'll lay my trophies down. Do you think that uh, God will be impressed with uh, whatever trophies and trinkets we have in this life? Will we uh, bring to him all those toys that we bought and enjoyed in this life? Uh, that's hardly what this hymn means, is it? I remember once when I was in the 30, my 30s and 40s, and it was always said in a joking manner, um, he, uh, he who has the most toys wins, right? You might have heard that before. And at that time, in our 30s and 40s, we may have had a few toys, uh, um, meaning an extra car or a boat or, or whatever it might be. But it would seem now that he who wins has the least toys, correct? Uh, that we take very little to heaven other than our faith 
and our works. And with that in mind, we should also think about our sacrifice in terms of what we give back to the Lord uh, through our giving. It is, a, it is a, a sacrificial giving. It is a giving that might actually hurt, but it's also a giving that is to be a cheerful uh, exercise. With that in mind, would you all pray with me, please? Father, we thank you. Certainly, Father, you do give us comforts of life. You give us automobiles and heat and air conditioning and, and uh, Father, money to spend not only for necessities, but even for those things that are above the necessity level, if you will. But we also thank you, Father, for giving us funds that we might share with others, Lord, and may our giving always be sacrificial, cheerful, Father, uh, from a heart that's giving, Lord, understanding that we don't take it with us. Our trophies that we lay down will be those things which are of a spiritual nature, Father, and not things which are material. Father, may material things never become between us and, and, and you, Father. May our love for you, uh, Lord, result in a generous heart, a generous manner of giving, Father. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for our presence here this morning, for this place where we worship. And Father, we make this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. And I thank you all for, for participating in the song service this morning. It makes it fun from up here to hear everyone sing. We have one last song in the hour of trial. We'll sing that and then we'll have a closing prayer, some announcements, and we'll be dismissed. In the hour of trial, Jesus, plead for me, lest my face be thank you this morning for, for bringing us all together here, that, that we might be encouraged uh, and edified through, through your word, through the, through the singing of praises to your name. Father, we pray that, that, uh, that we um, have served you well this morning, that, that, that you accept our, our, our worship and our praise. Father, we, we thank you that even though we might stray in this life uh, from from, from your from the teachings that are that were brought to us from from your will that that we have this path through repentance to to come back and 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 uh, and turn towards you once again father we pray that that all of us would consider uh, our lives and 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 see see where we might uh, need need to to consider more your your word and your will for us and that we might we might turn towards you every single day uh, always considering where where we are, Father, we pray that 
that uh, that you would be with all those who are mentioned in our on our prayer list, those that are uh, ill, those that are seeking uh, seeking healing. Father, we pray that you would be with them and, and be with the hands of those that are that are uh, that are helping them and, and their and their families and their friends that, that are surrounding them. And Father, we pray that that you would be with all uh, be with us all as we as we go out in, in, into the world. That we re- always remember that that you are our God that you are our help. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.